Good morning, uh, Kevin. It's uh, thank you so much for chatting with us today. Uh, to get us started, tell us a little bit about yourself and your initial experience uh, with disability. We're looking for any personal information you want to share from your life. So the floor is yours, sir. Sure. Well, um, thanks for having me, Graham. Uh, my name is Kevin Orr. I'm 53 years old and I'm from Pelham, Alabama. I'm originally from Illinois um, and I grew up uh, with a disability called arthrogryposis. Um, I'm an identical twin um, and my identical twin does not have any disability at all, um, which was probably a good thing for me because growing up uh, really um, everything that he encountered, um, I was able to experience as well. And really just, uh, it helped me how to adapt. Um, after I graduated from the University of Illinois, I moved to Alabama. Um, I met my wife. Uh, we were married in 1993. Um, and then now we have two children uh, who are adults um, of a 24 year old daughter and a 21 year old daughter um, who was married uh, one year ago. And uh, so really living a, a normal life of, uh, as most people would expect um, and really the, the experiences with my disability are just part of uh, part of life's experiences, and I think that's uh, what we all experience uh, in, in making our own adaptations and adjustments as we go along. All right, that's very good. So you say you're a twin. Did I hear you say that you were a twin. Yes, I, I'm an identical twin, um, and again, they yeah you know, they did a lot of tests when I was younger, um, and with arthrogryposis, I, I think sometimes. It seems like it's a catch-all disability grouping, uh, but basically, uh, essentially function like a, a T11 para, uh, but I do have full sensation, um, but I have limited range of motion in most of my joints. I'm including my shoulders, my hips, my knees, my ankles, um, and I don't really have any leg muscles um, uh, to speak of, I have hip flexors, um, and I can wiggle my toes, which is kind of a weird uh, deal, but it's, you know, again, I more or less function like a T11 para. That's interesting, very interesting. I know that, uh, I mentioned that too, because I'm also have a twin brother, and uh, he is, we're fraternal twins though, not identical, so I, I, we have some, a commonality besides both having disabilities, we have that commonality too, so as you know, October is National uh, Disability Employment Awareness Month. And these fireside chats um, are to highlight Alabamians with disabilities and their journey into employment. In that context, in the employment context, can you share with us what your first and subsequent experience were with employment and having a disability and how you got to your current career? Sure. Well, the, uh, my experience was growing up uh, with a disability, really wasn't sure what I was going to do. Um, and throughout grade school, um, you know, I had an interest in science, which was interesting. And I thought that I was going to uh, get into chemical engineering was my initial um, passion, I guess, because I was really good at science and math. Um, and you know, really trying to paint my picture as far as what I guess most people would normally think of, you know, couldn't really do a lot of blue collar work from, um, you know, the, a lot of the people that I had around me, that's kind of the, um, they were in trades and um, it was, it, it wasn't necessarily a, a path that um, I, I foresaw myself doing. And then, um, in the 1984 Olympic games, my mom calls me in um, and says, hey, check out this wheelchair racing event that's on uh, TV. Uh, there was a 1500 meter wheelchair exhibition uh, for men and an 800 meter exhibition for women. And during the, uh, the lead up for that, they mentioned a woman um, named Sharon Hedrick um, who actually won the event, but she talked about the University of Illinois um, and her husband was the uh, coach of the program and really, when I went there, they showed me a lot of different things about wheelchair sports, but also talked about the, um, the importance of education and the importance of employment and how sport 
leads into those type of things. It teaches the behaviors and things like that. And immediately I felt that's what I need to do. Um, is I felt that that's, that's the path where I need to go. It, it wasn't going to use science and the capacity of science, but it was to use sport as a mechanism to teach people that life skills that are learned through sports and recreation are avenues to independence and employment. Um, and really that was the direction where I went is not only competing in athletics, but also using the experiences of understanding how those things can help people uh, that have different disabilities do that. And then um, in uh, late uh, 1990, um, I did an internship at Lakeshore Hospital. Um, so I went from the University of Illinois and wanted to move south. Um, and Lakeshore Hospital and Lakeshore Foundation were doing programs for children with physical disabilities. So I wanted to do an internship in that environment I also got an opportunity to work in the rehab hospital and, and learn the recreation piece from that end. But really the interest of working with children and adults with physical disabilities was really what I wanted to do. So I had an opportunity to work with children. Um, and, and a lot of times people thought, well, you're gonna do this as a, you know, you're teaching sport. But uh, again, I, you know, I, I think the idea of sport and recreation, it's a great path to get people engaged in social skills, leadership, um, networking, all the kind of things that you need to be successful in employment. And, I, and that was the path that I took. So not only doing um, recreation programs, but did a lot of athletic programs. Um, and then in uh, January of 1991, I started my employment uh, at, for Lakeshore. Um, and I worked there for 18 years and I did many programs for children and adults. Um, some were very successful on the court, but my philosophy was always success breeds success. And, um, you know, with the, with the children's program, we did recreation programs, but we also did a career connections part of that, um, because, um, and it was with a woman named Bonner Wagner, who her husband worked for the department of rehab services. Um, but the idea is, again, it was sharing the philosophy that, you, know, you have children with different disabilities and they weren't sure what they were going to do. So trying to introduce uh, what kind of employment opportunities might be available through a recreation program. So it, it um, and then the wheelchair rugby program uh, that I coached, um, it was interesting. We had four, uh, four players on our team that uh, had master's degrees. We had some people that uh, were never employed and then talked to them about, um, you know, employment and, you know, how that can make you more independent, how that could uh, provide the resources so you can drive and live in a, live on your own and do all those kind of things. So um, when I left uh, in 2009, um, I'm happy to say that every player on our team uh, was employed or in school. Um, and again, it's a philosophy. It's uh, so instead of, uh, you know, living on social security and, you know, uh, having all the dependence on um, whatever kind of grants and things might be available, they're actually making their own living and, and being able to do things. So, you know, the, the success on the court, um, again, it carried over to success off the court. And I take uh, the greatest pride in, in that with the program that I did there. You know, and, and then I went to coach um, wheelchair rugby in Canada. I was there for seven and a half years, and I'm currently the head coach of the Japan national team. Um, and travel back and forth to Japan, uh, which we recently competed in the Tokyo Paralympic Games, um, uh, winning the bronze medal. And, and really part of the endeavor with those kind of things is really to teach the same kind of things as teaching independence. Um, you know, we have a lot of players that, that do work and um, they're playing competitively as well. So the philosophy continues and it's, uh, it's just a different mechanism. So would you say, Kevin, that um... So sports, so I hear that that sports uh, it gives people some of the skills they need to 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 work competitively out in the real world and get a job. Would you say that the sports helped you build your confidence? Did it give you confidence? I, I certainly think it gives you confidence. That you know, I, it shows you what you can do. I mean, a lot of times, you know, uh, growing up, a lot of people want to tell you what you can't do. And the thing through sport 
is you try to figure out how to do certain things and different ways to do it and how to be successful at it. So having that ability or that, um, that attitude, you know, some people may think it's elitist, but the idea is that we people with disabilities, we have to adjust. Um, not everything's gonna be you know, perfectly smoothly paved for us. So the idea is that you know, building those, uh, the confidence in ourselves and, and, our, and our ability to adapt to the real world, I think is the other thing that sport teaches us is that you know we can be adaptable we can figure out how to do certain things you know even though our bodies may not function a certain way we you know sport teaches us yeah you know, how to work with the things that we have and how to excel with the things that we have and i think that's the beauty that sports taught me that's great um do you, do you feel like your your internship uh starting out with an internship really helped you get a job well, the, you know, the idea is that, you know, I, I was a bit of an overachiever, but, you know, I wanted to do everything. And, you know, the idea is a person with a disability is a lot of times even doing an internship, you know, I think people somewhat want to prove what you can't do. And, um, you know, I, I wanted to go above and beyond what people's expectations might be. So I think the internship really helped me do things. And then from that, yeah, you know, I, I was expecting to go back to school um, and go back to the University of Illinois and uh, and work for a um, work for a master's degree and continue competing. Um, I had competed in the 1988 Seoul Paralympics and I was a top ranked wheelchair racer uh, with an expectation of competing in Barcelona. But really, the opportunity was afforded to me that they they actually created a job for me at Lakeshore. Uh, to be, it was a three-quarter time position as an in, uh, inpatient therapeutic recreation specialist and a quarter time community-based recreation program uh, doing youth programs as well as starting a wheelchair rugby program and doing some other recreation. Um, and it was funny because I'd end up working 30 hours a week as uh, kind of a clinical inpatient rec therapist. But then I was also working 20 to 30 hours a week as a um, as a person that was doing community-based recreation programs for kids and adults. Um, and then in 93, really that evolved into um, uh, the merger with HealthSouth uh, and ReLife um, afforded the opportunity for some financial opportunities for Lakeshore Foundation, uh, which allowed me to have a full-time job as a therapeutic recreation person, community-based setting for Lakeshore Foundation which was really, really great because um, then it allowed me to do full time really what I was hoping to do all along. So we've been talking about your career and where you start out. And you told us about your education and your family, um, just a few other things. Can you tell us about a time where, in your life where you had, you had adversity and you, and you overcame it? Well, the, the best opportunity I could tell you was um, uh, after uh, I lost my position as the head coach of Canada, um, I actually applied for several positions um, in and around Birmingham and in Alabama. Um, and I'd send my um, I'd send my resume out, and my resume basically screams that I have a disability. So, you know, denied opportunities. You know, here I am as a uh, as a head coach of an organization. Um, you know, doing really, really well, being successful. Um, and, and I mean, to me, that it, it really, it, it hurt almost, um, you know, asking around. And it was funny because I had heard about the National Disability Awareness Month uh, during that time, because it was in October um, of 2016. And um, I'm thinking, man, the... Um, the employability of people with disabilities is difficult because I mean, I have the skill set to do a lot of things, leading an organization and people putting trust in what I'm doing and going, okay, I'm sending out my resume to uh, basically for, uh, at the time it was even just minimum wage jobs to try to do something um, to pay my mortgage and to, you know, I had two children in college and I mean, I had to continue to, to provide for my family. So you know, after like four revisions, basically I just rooted it out and I put where my qualifications were. Um, 
And I think that was the, the thing is that, you know, people are going to look for employment um, and even showcasing what you have. I think it's to, um, it's to show the content of your character to borrow, you know, from Martin Luther King Jr. Yeah, I think that was the city of brotherhood that he was looking for. And the, uh, the idea of applying that to us is that we should be judged by the content of our character, not because we have a disability, not because the color of our skin or anything else. It's by what we can provide for an organization. And really that's what I put in my resume. And once I did that, I started getting more and more calls back and um, opportunities to interview for positions and doing that. And it was funny out of the blue, I just got a call um, from Japan and said, hey, we want you to be our head coach. And that was without applying. So. I mean, God works in mysterious ways, but the idea is the adversity that I, I dealt with is that it, it just proved to me that, that we should be defined by our character and by the things that we can provide people and not by um, any kind of perceived barriers that we think or where other people may think we have, is that let's show people what we're able to provide for them and, and uh, the value that we have uh, as employees and employable people, I think that's the, the beauty that we can provide. So, so basically, you had a lot of information at one time and resume about your disability. And then when you took a lot of that away and you just focus on your qualifications, then people began to see you as more employable. Is that what I hear? Yeah, well, I mean, because I've worked in... Um, the disability realm since uh, I was employed is, you know, I, I coached wheelchair sports. I did, you know, a lot of things, but instead of saying I coached wheelchair sports and I did this, this, and this, it was, I was able to lead a multi-million dollar organization. And um, I, I, again, putting the skills and abilities of what I did, not necessarily for whom, you know, although that was included in the information because it was who I was there for, but at the same time, as I think um, potential prospects of people that were looking for employees, they were able to look past, you know, okay, well, I did, you know, I, I was coaching, you know, whatever, um, or I did this kind of thing is that they, they wanted to see what kind of things I could provide for their organization, not, oh, well, he's a wheelchair user and uh, he's going to be, um, he's going to be a burden on our organization. It, you know, it, it really just put, Hey, I, you know, I, I at, uh, at a computer, I can, um, I can do public speaking. I can do budgeting. I can, um, I can manage people. I, you know, it's putting those kind of skills and that skill set, And it's really uh, boasting that and not, Hey, you know, we were, you know, five time national champion in wheelchair rugby, you know, um, because a lot of people really don't care about that. Well, that's impressive to me. Would you have any other advice for a person with a disability trying to get a job? You've given us some good information right there, what you just stated, but is there anything else that you might uh, offer else as advice to somebody with a disability when they're trying to obtain employment? Well, the, the, uh, having done youth programs, you know, a thing that I would really advise children and their adults, you know, um, again, a lot of people that I've worked with um, over 30 years, they wanted to focus on their disability. And, and my, my thing to them was you need to focus on what you want to do and then make yourself um, the best at that. So, you know, if you're going to be, um, if you're going to be a computer science person, you need to be very adept at computer science. Um, you, need, you need to be able to write code. You need to be able to do it proficiently. You need to be able to do it um, competitively um, because that's what employers want. And the thing is, is that they're not just going to hire you because, you know, they're going to fill a quota or do anything like that, is that they want to have valued employees. Um, and then you also want, it's not just about your ability to do a job, but you need to be able to get along well with people. And and to me, again, I think that, that sports was one of those things that really helped teach those behaviors. And I really encourage that with the children and adults that I work with. Um, and make yourself versatile. I think that's the other thing is that, you know, um, you know the more versatile you are, um, the, the more value that you provide an organization. So I think that's the other thing is that, you know, don't, don't put yourself in a box. Um, 
and and really show people what uh, you're able to provide for them. And I think that's the beauty of what I've been able to do. And I, I you know, then it, it's funny because I, I get more calls from outside of the, the state and country um, to, to want to do uh, what I do. Um, but I think people begin to recognize the value that you have. And I think the more that you can do that, um, I, I think that just gives, it makes you an asset for their organization. So that's excellent advice, uh, emphasizing the value that you can add to an organization and getting a job. That's excellent advice. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, so trying to switch to a little bit lighter topic, do you have a, a personal motto and uh, how do you apply that in your life? Uh, I've always had the motto is I can, you know, um, you know, you, you can, and, and I've, I think having a having an I can attitude um, really you, you try to figure out what you what you're going to do. I mean, I think that's probably been instilled in me since I was little. Is you know um, my my family growing up, you know, they really um, you know if I would ever feel down or anything like that, um, you know, it, you know can't never could uh, <laughs> all those kind of things. But really, it wasn't to think about the negative I can. not it's to think about I can. I, I think I've always had that. Um, that's always been part of my motto and the way that I live my life is you, know, you try to figure out how to do things, which it really goes to one of my, my hobbies is uh, I like to fish. I like bass fishing, uh, which fits in well in Alabama. But the beauty oh, of bass fishing is you have to figure out how to catch it. The bass don't care um, who you are, what you have, what, what your issues are. Um, it's your ability to catch the fish and adjust to what they're doing. So um, it really goes along with kind of my, my overall persona is, hey, I can do anything I put my mind to. I've got to adjust to the way that life um, comes at me. That's an excellent motto. I like it. I can. So you don't, you don't place any limits on yourself. You adapt to any situation. And I like your fishing analogy. That's very good. You know, just think of a job as a fish out there and you can grab hold of it. You know, uh, it cares about what your skills are. That's what really matters. That's what I hear you saying. Your skills are what matters and develop those. This is, a, this is excellent. So uh, question I have, um, what is the most important lesson you've learned on your journey and what advice or words of encouragement would you give to others on their journey to employment? Well, I think it's always learning. I think that's the, the thing along my journey is you're always trying to learn and you're always trying to better yourself or diversify yourself. Um, as I've seen going through life is that, you know, one thing that may have worked 10 years ago isn't applicable today. So it's the more that you can kind of, um, learn new skills, try new things, get along the way. Um, look ahead too, to see what kind of trends are going that direction is what am I going to be not, you know, Hey, I'm doing this great now, but what is it going to look like in my future as well? So it's adjusting to the future um, as well as, you know, perfecting what you're doing today. So, um, and I guess I've never been satisfied. And that's the other thing too, is that, um, you know, I think if, once you kind of get satisfied, then um, you stop challenging yourself and you stop growing. And I think the, the more that you can keep growing, um, I, I really think that that's the, the key to our success is that, um, you know, we're not stagnant and things keep going forward and, and you're excited to go to work. And uh, it's just really, um, and then you have passion. I think that's really, um, having passion for what you do is also very, very important. This is great advice. Um, it's a Kevin Orr's how-to guide, and this is based on your life. And you're in your you're definitely an excellent role model. Uh, you you tell a lot of people, you know, in coaching these teams and giving people confidence and using sport as a stepping stone into employment. Uh, I've kind of, you know, you've given us a roadmap here today. Couple, another question I wanted to ask you. So these, so pay attention to what uh, Kevin Orr is saying here today. He's giving you some great advice. Um, 
Can you share with us what you would consider to be your greatest success? I think the greatest success that I have are the people that I've mentored along the way and the way that they're currently giving back. So um, in 1992, I actually wrote a vision statement of the youth program that I was doing at the time at Lakeshore. Um, and, and one of those was to see um, a similar program that I was involved with at the University of Illinois be at some of the universities in Alabama. And uh, currently the University of Alabama and Auburn University have adapted sports programs. Um, there are also youth programs that are currently provided in Montgomery uh, through Huntington College. Um, and there are programs uh, up north um, in Madison uh, that are done by people that were um, involved with uh, a movement that we did, which was a statewide uh, we called it Super Sports Saturday Project um, that we did in Birmingham, Tuscaloosa, Anniston, Decatur, um, Montgomery, and Mobile. Um, and it was a youth program, but really from the youth, we've had people that have actually gone out and they're currently mentoring other children um, and adults with disabilities to be active, engaging people um, in their communities. And to me, that's the greatest. Um, accomplishment I think I've ever had is that to have mentors that are going on and and other people that are on a program I, I've got um, kids or, you know potential disciples or what have you you know I have a person that's lobbying in DC I have um, a couple uh, former kids that you know they're PhDs that are running programs in different parts of the country um, I mean, to me, that's the greatest uh, accomplishment I think I could have. And, you know, and, and then to see the success of my own family and my kids, um, you know, I think that's, a, that's another byproduct of that as well as, you know, since I've been able to coach, uh, I've been actually been able to be a dad and seeing their success is also another encouraging thing. So having mentors and uh, having disciples um, uh, to, to continue the journey, I think is, uh, a, a great achievement. That's great. So you're, uh, you made a lasting impact on other people and you, you started programs that have been carried out in other places besides Alabama. That, that is definitely a, a, an awesome success. And is there anything else today that you want to share with us? Any question that I didn't ask, but that you were hoping I'd ask and you, you, some other information you'd like to share? Well, I, you know, I, I've known you for a long time and, um, you know, we started our journeys very similar, but I think our paths are really the same. You know, it was to encourage people to live healthy, productive lives. Um, and I, I think the idea behind that is that we can do it with whatever path, whether it's through law uh, as you have taken or if it's through sport, the road that I've taken, is that we have we each have an opportunity to impact others. And I think the more that we can uh, take advantage is not just looking at ourselves, but looking at how we can help other people uh, meet their potential. I think the beauty of that is, um, is what you've done. And I think um, I've had that impact as well. And I think the more people that we can continue to have that, um, the, the greater life we have ahead. And to me, that's the uh, it, it's been an honor to know you, and I, I hope that uh, people don't get discouraged because they have a disability, because um, a lot of times I think people uh, generally limit themselves to what they can do, and I, I hope through uh, your leadership um, and other opportunities that are in our state, um, people can enjoy uh, the work environment and enjoy Alabama. Well, thank you. This is, I want to say, Again, thank you so much for doing this interview. Uh, busy man, coaching teams in other countries, world traveler, has made a significant impact in disabilities, but also outside of disabilities. People see you as a role model too, and they say, look at the doors that you've opened, and they're able to see that they can also do it. And that's what's so significant about all of your great work, Kevin. And I'm certainly honored to know you and you inspire me also. 
and I certainly uh, am very appreciative of your sharing your story and some personal details and the things that you've overcome. And, and I really like your motto, I can, that it's very simple, but it's, it, it means a lot. And I think I'm hoping people hear that today and they also say, I can also. So thank you, Kevin. You, we really appreciate this and, um, and please uh, keep in touch. You've heard Kevin's uh, video, and I think, uh, Kevin, are you on the line, sir? Are you? Um, I am here. Are you on that? Oh, I like your background. That's awesome. That is great. Wow. What, what a big logo behind you. And I guess you can read the Japanese over there on part of the flag right behind you, the banner. So. I'm getting better at Japanese. I'm not really fluent, but... Uh, certainly um, understand more than I, I have, so. All right, well, thank you for being here today. Um, I wanted to see if anybody had any questions for uh, Kevin, a uh, follow-up question. You saw his, his great presentation, his remarks. Um, and here's a question that we have, somebody just posted in the chat. Uh, Kevin, what difficulties have you encountered in seeking accommodations and what uh, advice would you have for those who need to request them? I don't know that I've had a lot of accommodation requests I, and the organizations that I've worked in have been working for uh, people with disabilities. So I think the openness to that has been very easy, really. I, I've had an easy path as far as that goes. But as far as looking for accommodations, advice I've given people in the past, is just be open and honest. I mean, I think letting people understand what you need to be able to provide uh, service for them is, is important because they'll value you as far as what you're able to provide and just letting them understand, hey, I, I need this accommodation to be able to, to provide this for you. And, and also go into it, not trying to take advantage of a situation. Um, I, I've seen that as well, where people try to use that um, in, in a negative way, is that, you know, using the accommodation to make sure that you can do your job and do it well, um, I think is the best advice I can give you. All right, thank you. That's, that's good advice. Um, and I think uh, we've got a few more questions. Let me go back. I'm going to try to get these. Um, let's see. The next question has to do with sports are are. Uh, usually a hobby for some people. Since you work in the sporting arena, do you have a different hobby or hobbies? Well, uh, my my hobby is bass fishing. Um, <laughs> you know, so I, I have a bass boat. I, I try to get out and enjoy the lakes here in Alabama um, and, and go. And, I, you know, again, you have to figure it out, you know, figuring out how, like I I drive my boat to the lake. I put the boat in the water. I, I do all those things. You have to figure it out. Um, yeah, and I mean, to me, that's, it's, it's more than fishing. Uh, but it's, yeah, that's the cool thing is if you have a passion to do something, you figure out ways to do it. And that's uh, whether it's in sport or whether it's in life or it's employment. Uh, I mean, to me, it, it, it's all part of the great picture is that we just figure out how we can do things. That's good, and, and, you, and you get a lot of get enjoyment. I've got a few hobbies, too, that um, I adapted so I could do them, and, and that was part of the fun, figuring out how to, to do it. So and then once you did it, the accomplishment that you feel. I know you feel accomplishment when you have a, a, even a hobby and you have successful results from it, and you enjoy it. So uh, that's good. Um, here's a question, uh, and this is a... Uh, Hey, Coach Kev says, I'm blessed to be one of Kevin's kids from the 90s at Lakeshore. As someone who, uh, who uh, mentored kids through the post-ADA era, I'm curious how well youth appreciate and understand their rights and how it came about. Uh, thanks for all that you do. So any comments to that comment, Kevin? Well, uh, again, Matthew is one of the disciples, I suppose. I mean, when, um, you know, I, there's a few of the people that I've worked at, um, that were kids um, that are working in the Department of Rehab Services. And, uh, you know, I appreciate the work that Matthew does. I mean, because again, it's continuing um, 
the same message really. And I, I think we all have that message and it's great to see him, you know, when he got married and when he had children, I, I mean, to me, those are the, the greatest, um, it, it's the greatest satisfaction you can have because a lot of times, especially when I was growing up in the seventies, you know, the idea is people never thought that you were going to get married or have children. Or even when I got married, there were people talking at the reception of, Oh, well, my poor wife is, she's never going to experience the um, motherhood or, you know, I mean, there's all the, the negativity that happens with that. But then when you start seeing, you, you change the stereotypes and, and Matthew is one of those people that I've seen him live his life. Um, and he's having that same effect. So now he's creating disciples. It's, it's a beautiful thing to see. Um, Cause that was really the plan all along. All right. Well, you, uh, Mission accomplished. That's an excellent example, and I appreciate both of y'all sharing your, your your views on that. I think that's a really good way. And, and I think that we don't know how 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 many times our lives touch other people's lives and the ripple effect. I would even call it the ripple effect in, in a good positive way. All the ripples that come out from people seeing your your successful life and Matt's successful life. So. Um, Here's a question that I have. Um, let's see, a few more questions coming in. Let's see, hold on. Oops, all right, let me go back to the chat here. All right, it says. One, one question that, um, have you noticed any differences in attitudes towards people with disabilities in Japan versus the United States? I think this is a great question here. Well, um, Generally, I think people are accepting um, in Japan. I think that's probably, um, uh, it seems that there's more acceptance of people. Uh, the way that I've seen it is they'll look at people um, as people. I, and I think that's somewhat the culture in Japan is, it's a very respectful culture. It's great to be involved with. Um, but Japan does not have uh, something like the Americans with Disabilities Act. so. It's, it's, it's a very interesting thing because the employability of people with disabilities, they have, I'd call them almost job coaches that find jobs for uh, people with disabilities once they're uh, of age to start working in the working sector. Um, so they didn't need to necessarily have a, um, an ADA to, to help with that. But um, I, I mean, of, the, of our team, uh, all of them have a, a job coach in our position within facilities to work. So wh whatever their skill set is, they have that. Um, that's something that's very different from what we have. And then generally attitude, I mean, I, even when I'm just out and about, I mean, I, I feel very welcome, never get kind of the stared at uh, thing that will happen yeah. to us. Even today, it, it happens a lot more. But even now, I mean, the um, things have changed. So some of the younger folks on here may not appreciate some of the things that we dealt with in the 70s and 80s, um, having a disability, because very rarely they would see people with disabilities. So there'd be a lot more staring and questions and things like that, even more so than what we see today. Wow. So um, what about accessibility, physical accessibility in Japan? It's, it's pretty good. And even though there's not an ADA, I mean, to get on and off the trains and to do uh, their curb cuts everywhere in Tokyo and, and even in the small towns, um, mostly there are elevators there. The difficulty is finding accessible rooms and they call them universal rooms, which I think is a cool, um, a cool name for them. Um, and then when they do an accessible room, um, it's, it's above and beyond. I mean, they, the bathroom is basically a wet room, so you can roll in there in your chair, you can roll up, uh, it's essentially a roll in shower, or you can transfer into a bathtub. Um, it, it, I mean, it's, it, it's above and beyond what you would look for here, but because space is such a commodity in Tokyo, um, they're, they're more challenging to find. So, you know, you have to find out where these places are. And if, if you go there with a group of people with disabilities, there may only be one universal room at that hotel because again, space is a commodity. So um, it's important to do your homework ahead of time if you plan on traveling to Japan. But again, overall um, accessibility, 
getting around people's attitudes are great in Japan and uh, it, it's really a great country. Um, I, I would love to see people experience it. It's good. Well, maybe I'll, I'll add it to my bucket list of places to visit. Uh, seriously, because uh, we so I've heard good things about it. So thank you for sharing that. That's uh, the question is employers are learning every day how to better accommodate individuals with disabilities. What would you like them to know about individuals who use a wheelchair and how to better accommodate them? Can you give them any advice on how to help their employees? Well, again, I, I think it's it's individualizing the accommodations is that everyone's accommodation is should be individualized to them um because what works for me is not necessarily going to work for another individual so i think the biggest thing is is there needs to be open communication just letting people know what what the needs are um you know if you make a if you make a room accessible you know look, like when I work, I like to transfer into a different chair. I don't like to stay in my wheelchair. Other people like to stay in their chair. And again, it, it, I think there's a lot of preference, you know, as far as height. Some people like things up a little bit higher. Some people like things lower. Some people don't like things really, really low. And again, it's making the accommodation meet the, the need of the individual um, and, and just openly communicating what that is. Um, and, you know, then, you know, as far as, you know, sometimes where the accessible bathroom is, um, you know, putting the office closer to that. Um, it, it, I mean, sometimes a facility may have only one accessible bathroom, but the bathroom is, you know, it, it's a far push away to, to get to that. Um, so it's making some simple, uh, what I would say common sense kind of uh, things. Um, but limit the barriers, I think, is the biggest thing. And again, communication is the key to that. All right, good. more sound advice. Thank you, Kevin, that's great. Um, also, we have another question. You have been such a great mentor to others. Do you have a mentor or someone who, turned, who you turn to or go to now for mentoring or advice? Well, um, I had two great coaches when I was at the University of Illinois, um, Marty Morse and Brad Hedrick, uh, who was mentioned in the, the fireside chat. Um, I don't necessarily reach out to, to them today um, as often as maybe I should. Um, and I, I mean, I, I follow some different leadership uh, things. I, I, I try to stay tuned in uh, current trends. So. Um, Dr. Service at Sanford University has helped me with some leadership uh, skills. He teaches leadership at Sanford University. Um, I have others that I've kind of uh, looked at as far as that goes, but generally um, there's no person I necessarily lean to and maybe I should. It's all right. I mean, um, I think that probably you've had multiple experiences and different things you've picked up and you you're, you're a self-starter and a self-learner, so and, and you, you've been able to adapt very well to different change requirements. And I like what you said, you try to keep up with the current trends. And I think that's an, ex, that's an excellent suggestion for people to follow also. Um, all right, well, do we have other questions? These have all been really good questions. Uh, Kevin is, is a great wealth of information and experience. Uh, He's a role model. Uh, he continues to do great things. Uh, and sometimes when people just see other folks uh, like them getting around, um, that inspires them. So you don't even know, you don't even realize when you're out in public that you're inspiring other people uh, who, who have disabilities. So they see you getting around successfully and they, and they say, I can do that. To use your motto again, I can. It's simple. It's straightforward. It's perfect. Um, but we got just some other comments. Awesome story, Kevin. Very inspiring. So that's, I didn't, when I said inspiring, Kevin, I, I said that before it came to the comments, just, just so you know. So, so. all right. Um, other, anything else? Um, says, uh, thank you for being willing to speak to us with all the time difference, too. I know when you originally did it, you're like a, 
I got a little bit of jet lag here. Give me a few days to get over the time differential. So, um, any other questions or comments for Kevin? So, I think this will be a good video to archive, Kevin. When, when, when we're in our 80s, and we can go back and look at it and say, yeah, do you remember that day in October of 2021 during, during all the pandemic? And uh, we had a great opportunity to meet for, uh, virtually. And it's, it's, um, oh, here's another question for you. Thank you, Kevin, for your story. Where are you from in the Chicago area? Well, sorry, I replied to someone else, but um, I'm from Algonquin, Illinois, so it's about 45 miles northwest of Chicago. Um, it was a small town, but now it's uh, it's boomed into, uh, I guess, a fairly substantial commuter uh, suburb of the Chicagoland area. All right, Algonquin, I like the way that sounds. Native American yes. sound. So. All right, other questions or comments for Kevin? So you had a lot of good questions and people are very interested in your story and, and all of your advice, Kevin. Um, definitely, I, I plan to keep in touch with you. Even if, you're, even if you're around somewhere else, I may be calling you someday too for advice myself and uh, particularly traveling around the world. Uh, I'm interested when I'm retired uh, doing that. I've only had one opportunity, I went to Scotland but I would certainly like to go to Japan and any other countries that you have visited. Um, I would, how, how many different foreign countries have you been to, uh, Kevin? I'm not exactly sure. I think about over 30 for sure. Uh, but I've been to Japan probably uh, 45 times or made 45 trips. So I've made that 12 and a half hour flight uh, 90 times so you know I, I'm, I'm well versed you know I have over 600,000 miles of travel within the last uh, five years or so so it's been uh, been quite a journey for sure. Wow that's incredible 30 foreign countries wow um, I've had two or three so but that's that's awesome <laughs> that's great all right well um, anybody any other final comments or questions for Kevin? All right, well, um, thanks again for taking all this time, Kevin, uh, for the initial video and today answering all the questions. Uh, I think this is going to rank uh, very high. It, in my opinion, one of the top, uh, you know, stories that we've had. Um, it, people can definitely relate to you, and I think, uh, and keep on trucking and i look forward to hearing about your next great thing kevin uh and if, call me anytime and if i can help you please call and keep in touch with me if you hear about a trend that you think i need to know about and i can share the information with other people too so um everybody liked your story get a lot of comments so well, I really appreciate it, Graham. And if I can be a help when I'm at home, uh, that's the great thing about my uh, my job is when I'm home, I'm I'm very flexible. Uh, but that's when I'm home, so um, I'd be happy to help people in Alabama to to continue the journey because um, you know it's it's certainly a passion of mine. And again, to see a lot of the the former people that I've I've had the, the great opportunity to know, um, would love to help them continue the journey. Um, while I'm here. So um, happy to help and happy to be, a, I, I'm available uh, if necessary. So you can look me up on Facebook uh, or Twitter and uh, contact me that way or, uh, and then you can email me as well. All right, well, thank you, uh, Kevin. Um, again, um, keep keep on trucking as I said, and, um, and certainly, uh, if you have any questions and uh, for Kevin, uh, I'll be glad to relay them to him um, or you can contact him otherwise. But thanks again, everybody, for attending today. Uh, uh, happy uh, National Disability Employment Awareness Month. And I think uh, Kevin brought us additional awareness and ideas today.